Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to my library tour. Sorry that that was the only video yesterday when you're expecting five videos from your friendly neighborhood gas bag and you only get one. That has to be quite a shock. Yesterday just got away from me. Just uh, just totally got away from me. I had errands to run and it was really hot and uh, that was a small part. I've, I've made my requisite five videos a day under those conditions. I just, one thing after another piled up and it just, uh, it just didn't come together. Uh, but I'm hoping for more today <laughs> because I miss seeing your faces. Uh, and today, right now anyway, we're doing the library tour. We're continuing with this library tour of mine where we're working our way through the history section, which is this entire east wall. And we're almost, relatively speaking, almost done. We have about a week's worth of videos more to do on this. And then we'll be done with this whole room. We will have finished this whole room. Oh, which is kind of amazing. I didn't think it would ever happen. Uh, so we're doing the middle stack now. And if we're going to be talking about books, we need a cap, as per Jason Harrington. Uh, oh, oh God. <coughs> <laughs> and today, uh, it would be a dog cap, just a simple dog cap. Uh, so let's see what we have here. The first one is, uh, there'll be a lot of university presses here, I bet, but this is mostly university presses. First we have Yale, Yale University Press. This is Erwin Gelman's book, The President and the Apprentice, about the relationship between President Eisenhower and Vice President Nixon. Uh, and I really liked it. I don't know if I am uh, blurbed on it. Probably not. Probably a lot of heavyweights got blurbed instead. Uh, yeah, I'm not. Well, Tim Stanley is. And he's wonderful. Uh, but this is, I thought it was really meaty. Really, really good. Uh, impossible for the author to hide the, the ugly truth of that relationship. The ugly truth of that relationship is the same no matter whether it's Eisenhower or anybody else, including the Nixon children. It's one of seething unbridled subterranean hatred. <laughs> uh, but I thought it was really good, especially on the details of Nixon during those years. Uh, oh, okay, great. Uh, then we have, uh, boy, this was a great book. I don't know that this technically belongs here. This really ought to be a biography. Uh, this is Richard Burke's life, uh, called his book Empire and Revolution, The Political Life of Edmund Burke. And this is uh, Princeton. This is the paperback, but I loved this book. Just loved it. Uh, Burke is a a bit of a political anomaly. I think a lot of people, including this author, who write about his political philosophy are seeing things that, are, that aren't there. <laughs> I think Burke is awful squishy when it comes to stuff like that, but still endlessly fascinating. Uh, and this author really catches that, really catches the glimmer of his mind, which is wonderful. Uh, okay, this next one is uh, an author we have seen before, uh, and we may see again. This is... Uh, Peter Longerich, and this is The Holocaust. This is his book on the Holocaust. Uh, so we saw his, um, at least one of his biographies. Uh, and this is his, you know, his study on the Holocaust. You sort of have to write a book like this. And his, uh, his new book, which we've seen not in a library tour, but in a mail hall, is an enormous biography of, of Adolf Hitler. Uh, and I have loved his work, and I have praised it highly. Uh, but I, I believe, unless I reviewed the Himmler book, I believe that his Hitler book will be the first time that I will ever review him on an international platform. I will, I'll be reviewing the Hitler book for the Christian Science Monitor, so I'll get a chance to... to it's a different feeling. I mean, you can, you can really like an author and you can really recommend an author to people you know, when you meet them in conversation, but it's a different feeling. It's a different kind of dynamics to, to grapple with them on the printed page. That adds an element to it. I'm looking forward to doing that. Sometimes it even changes my mind on people. Uh, uh, okay. All right. All right. This next one you have seen on this channel. I believe a long time ago you saw me haul this book. It was a used book. I found a used book, I think, at the Brattle Bookshop. This is volume nine of the Cambridge Ancient History. This is the volume on the Roman Republic, and the old Cambridge Ancient History volumes are fantastic because under a very good editorial team of oversight, they would get some of the greatest scholars alive in the time to write individual chapters. Sometimes, like in this book, uh, excuse me, in this book, uh, the same scholar will write a few chapters. Sometimes it'll be just one scholar writing a chapter, and it makes these volumes intensely collectible because you're getting a, a different scholar's viewpoint on these things. The, the writer who is writing about, for instance, Rome's relationship with the East during the Republican period will change 
from one update of the Cambridge Ancient History to the next. Uh, and and same thing with all the other volumes. And uh, that has uh, two main benefits. One is that it, it gives you all of these great people, some of whom you're reading whole books of on their own. And two is it prevents these books from codifying into a, a single interpretive viewpoint. Instead, you've got people who often uh, very much disagree with each other, just independently commissioned to do these separate subjects. I love them, and I found this volume of the Cambridge Ancient History, I think, at the Brattle, and uh, knew that I wanted it. The, the Republican era of Rome is, especially the late Republican era, is a source of endless fascination for me. But what I found at the Brattle was a naked hardcover. It's it, it, these these huge Cambridge Ancient History volumes, these thousand pages, almost impossible to find one with a heart, with a dust jacket, and uh, I brought it back here and I thought, well, I don't really want a naked hardcover on my shelf, but instead of reinforcing a cover, if you've got a naked hardcover, you don't have anything to reinforce. I will make a cover. I will take some paper, fold it accordingly, and make a cover uh, to to put around the naked hardcover. See that? Uh, and I, so I did that, and then, uh, then it was just this blank cover. And I thought, well, you can do better than that, can't you? If this thing's going to be on your shelf, if you're going to be consulting it, and I do, I go back to this volume all the time. In fact, I have uh, a review coming up next month where I'm going to have to go back to this volume again. Uh, I thought, if it's going to be there, you should customize it completely. You're not ever going to sell this thing, so it's yours until the end, until you get carded out feet first. So why not just make a cover for it. Not just a protection, but also a design. <laughs> so I did that. <laughs> I did that. So on the spine, I, I instead of calling it the Cambridge Ancient History Volume 9, which is kind of boring, I called it Republican Rome. See that? There's a Roman column. And then I needed a cover. I don't need a back cover. If I were really cheeky, I would put a whole bunch of blurbs by myself, invented blurbs by myself. But I needed a front cover. And I was, I was going back and forth here thinking, well, you know, should I maybe cut out a color picture of Pompey the Great or something like that, post that on there. And then I thought I had a, a, a burst of inspiration because I was looking through, some of you will remember that I absolutely love New Yorker cartoons. I just love them. I have a whole bunch of old collections of them. I think they are emojis before there were emojis. There is a New Yorker cartoon. If you know the back catalog well enough, there's a New Yorker cartoon to perfectly summarize everything. <laughs> every moment, every mood, every attitude. Uh, and I remembered vaguely one that would have worked perfectly and then I found it. I found it and I had many doubles of it. So I cut it out and made it into the cover of this book. And it is a pair of typical New Yorker uh, clueless tourists. <laughs> and I included the caption at the bottom. The caption is, I suppose there's quite a story behind all this. <laughs> and this is that story. So, I, so now I have, I have the exact cover that I want. I suppose there's quite a story behind all this. Well, yes, this is the story. So, uh, so now I have a, a completely customized volume of, uh, of Republican Rome. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Okay, this next one is The Liberal Hour, Washington and the Politics of Change in the 1960s. Uh, I believe this also was uh, a late find. I don't think I, I don't think I got this from Penguin Press. I think they came out with this when I was not reviewing. That feels so strange to say now. It feels like I was doing it straight through, but I did. 2008. Okay, so right at right when I was back getting back into reviewing, when I wouldn't have had, I wouldn't have had the thought in my head to request this from Penguin. I wouldn't have had any contacts left anyway to request. I, those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, I was a reviewer, a book reviewer for a long time in the American Midwest. Uh, and then I stopped for a quarter of a century. And then I got back into reviewing and, and uh, had to pretty much start from scratch. And there was one person, wasn't at Penguin Press, it was Viking. Uh, one publicist that I was dealing with 10 years ago, who's since gone on to other things. Uh, but she, we were emailing back and forth and she was saying, boy, oh boy, you, you seem to know this subject really well. Uh, and I said, yeah, I, I used to book review. Uh, a long time ago, and I've been following this author, including reviewing some of their books. And she got back to me about a week later and said, I was at a lunch with my boss, and I brought you up, and I swear I thought he was going to pass out. All the blood drained from his face. And he said, that can't be the same Steve Donahue that I dealt with 30 years ago. It can't be. 
And it was. <laughs> I vaguely remembered his name from when he had her job as a minor newt little thing. <laughs> uh, but that's the only example. Everybody else, I had to start from scratch. So I wouldn't have requested this book. But I would have had a field day with it if I got it for the old Open Letters Monthly. Uh, okay, this one I believe I did review. Uh, this is a great book. This is Stephen Pinkus, 1688, the First Modern Revolution. A big, uh, oversized book. I don't know if you can if you can tell. This is this is slightly oversized. Uh, from Yale about the Glorious Revolution, and Pincus does the subject more justice than anyone has ever done. It's just uh, amazingly comprehensive, uh, in large part because it's amazingly amazingly international. I uh, I had it as an advanced copy from Yale for Open Letters Monthly. And I think I wrote about it, and then I got rid of it, and then I got the finished copy, and I think I got rid of that as well. And I didn't get this trade paperback from Yale. I got this from a used bookstore. I just It was one of the many examples, or not many, hopefully not many, one of the examples of a book that you know is really good almost as soon after you get rid of it as you do, and then you just hope you'll find it again. There are a handful of those that are out there, <laughs> and this I'm glad this is no longer wandering around in the wilderness. Uh, ah... Okay. Okay. Uh, this is David Kirby's book, Death at SeaWorld, uh, which is about the, the ongoing, uh, the then ongoing travesty of keeping adult killer whales in uh, animal parks, immobile, isolated, doing stupid children's shows three times a day. Uh, and also about one of those was the size of a city bus, a, a killer whale named Tillicum. Uh, who by the time he got to SeaWorld was a proven killer, a proven uh, homicidal maniac. He, Tillicum had been driven insane by his captors within a year of being ripped away from his family unit on the open ocean. And by the time he got to SeaWorld, by the time he was the marquee attraction, because there's a huge sexual dimorphism between a male and female killer whales, so that, and the, the people at SeaWorld knew this, so that the crowds would be packed in the amphitheater and the females would come out. They come, they come rushing out, been, uh, out into the pool from um, you know subterranean enclosures, so that it maximizes the surprise. It maximizes the thrill of these big things coming out, and the crowd would go ooh ah, and then there would be a dramatic pause, and then Tillicum would come out, and he was twice as big as the other two. He was as big as both of them put together, and the uh, the crowd would just go wild. And then people, trainers, would get into the water and do tricks with these animals, and it was rapidly clear to the powers that be at SeaWorld, that every time a trainer went into the water with Killicum, Silicum, they were risking their lives. That It wasn't just that he was too rough, it was that he liked to kill people. <laughs> uh, and did eventually kill a, a trainer. It just And she wasn't even in the water with him. He reached up and yanked her into the water by her hair and ripped her apart in front of, at SeaWorld there were, you know, the amphitheaters, but you also have the subterranean levels that have plate glass so that people can have a dinner at a high-priced cafe while they're watching the animals under the water. And all of the people at that cafe saw this happen. They all just saw this, this woman get uh, basically de-skinned. Tillichon ripped her to pieces. Um, and this is a book about all of those tragedies and about Tillicum. And I reviewed it uh, for the National in Abu Dhabi. And I gave the review a lot of time. I gave it a, a, a lot of attention. I cared about that review a lot. And to this day, that this was, what, 10 years ago? This was probably 10 years ago. Since this book came out, the, the documentary Blackfish came out and shut down the industry, basically. Uh, but this was, okay, 2012. So uh, not 10 years ago, but a long time ago. And uh, uh, to this day, this is the, the review of mine at the National that still gets the most mail. I still get mail from people from all over the world about that review. <laughs> and even though the industry has changed completely because of this book, um, and the, in this paperback, the national is blurbed. I'm not blurred by name, but my, my review is blurbed on this paperback. And it is, so far as I know, the only time to date where one of my blurbs is in a pile of, of blurbs with a blurb by Jane Goodall. So <laughs> it made Steve feel pretty good. Uh, uh, okay, uh, this next one is, um, is from, uh, this is a Penguin paperback. Uh, this is Stephen Hahn, A Nation Without Borders, The United States and Its World in the Age of Civil Wars, 1830 to 1910. So a big su uh, survey history that was really good, really entertaining. Uh, and 
thought provoking. This is not, this is a much traveled ground, and this this guy does a really good job. Um, okay, here's another. I'm just I'm just reflexively checking these things for blurbs by me, uh, but they're good anyway. <laughs> this is Richard Evans. This is Pursuit of Power. Big, gigantic, another survey history of his, just a, a huge thing uh, that I really, really enjoyed. This is from uh, a basically close to the same thing. It's also the Age of Revolutions. It, this is 1815 to 1914. Uh, and this author has, I think, a, kind of a knack for big amorphous survey volumes. A lot of authors just lose their way. Uh, and this one is, is very, very good, very pointed. Uh, Okay, all right, this is a trade paperback. I won't be blurbing this because I don't think I reviewed it at all. But this was terrific. Um, this was terrific. This is by Lisa Brooks. This is Our Beloved King, a, a kin, a new history of, of King Philip's War, which is a very New England-y type thing. It's a very, pre, it's a colonial era uh, armed conflict that isn't well enough known even by Americans. Most Americans, if you ask them, won't know anything. You don't have any idea what you're talking about. Uh, even the ones I... I uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I had this conversation with someone who got a degree in education from a state school and is a high school history teacher in, um, well, at the time it was Texas. And I, I, you know, we were talking and I said to her, well, you know, when you're doing a survey of, of pre-revolution America, do you even mention King Philip's War? And she had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, so if you, if you are an American, especially if you're an American in uh, what was then the original colonies, the Eastern Seaboard, and you don't know what I'm talking about, then you should find this book at your library because you're not going to find a better volume about it. Um, ah, oh my, okay, this is another book. This is from Yale, and this is another one where this would, this came out when I was not reviewing, or I would have eaten this alive. 2005, so before Open Letters Monthly started, before uh, I was convinced to get back into book reviewing, and before... I got back into book reviewing and realized, oh my god, I love this just as much as I once did. Why did I ever leave this? In other words, once I realized that it was a good idea. But this was before that. This was before Open Letters Monthly started, or I would have been all over it. This is G.W. Bernard's The King's Reformation. And it is a serious study about Henry VIII and religious reform. Who knew that such a thing was even possible? I don't think there, that there's a panorama of, a panorama of wives anywhere in this book. Instead, it's, it's, it actually operates from the assumption that King Henry VIII was an intelligent person, however homicidal he might have been, and that he was also important as a king, not just as the center of a soap opera. It's, this is all about the, the, the Reformation in England and the Reformation on the continent. Fantastic volume. Just fantastic. Uh, oh, okay. All right. And then we have, uh, this is the last book that we'll, that we'll do today. This is John Adams. And, oh boy, I wish I had all these guys' books. I once upon a time did. Uh, this is uh, what a friend of mine plaintively said once we met in the middle of a day. We met for a visit, and I was carrying this book. I was reading it and annotating it and whatnot, and this friend plaintively said over and over again, That's the largest book in the world! <laughs> I don't think it is, but it's pretty big. This is John Adamson's The Noble Revolt, and it is big. It is a huge book. This is about... Uh, what we saw at the beginning of this history tour. This is when we see we saw Wedgwood's book, The King's War and the King's Peace. This is essentially that subject. Adamson went on to write other volumes all about uh, this this very turbulent period in British history, and I wish I had them all. They're all huge. This is the only one I have, and I don't know why. I have, at one point or another, had all those other volumes. I wish I'd kept them. Uh, really, really conversant with sources. Really, really good. Very, very similar in its um, sort of magisterial tone to Dermot McCullough, uh, only on a, on a different period. I I, uh, I am fascinated by the overthrow of Charles I and the exile of Charles II and the return, the glorious return of Charles II and his government. Fascinated by that whole period, and this is one of the one of the well, certainly the biggest book I have on the subject, but it's also one of my favorite ones. Uh, and that uh, does it. That is our the next rung of our library tour here. So. We're going to finish with this top shelf tomorrow, it looks like. Um, and that's great. And one thing I forgot to do yesterday was add my annotations. Ordinarily, when I'm done with a video and I'm uploading it, I will look all around to find as much writing as I've ever done on the stuff in the video. I don't know if that's of any interest uh, to the rest of you, but I figure might as well have the links right handy if you are interested. 
And I didn't do that yesterday. I, the day just completely got away from me. Um, and part of it, I admit, was was poisonal. <laughs> part of it was, I mean, it was noticeably hot yesterday. It was 90 degrees and uh, very humid. And I, when it gets that way, I worry about Frida. She has uh, a marked tendency to overheat. She just goes limp as a noodle in the heat. And yet wants to do stuff. We were out on her. We went, I, when, I, when it's hot like that, I take her on many little walks instead of any one long walk. Uh, and she doesn't like that. <laughs> she likes our big rambles in the woods. Uh, but we, there was no way that I could have done it. I would have come back with a dead dog. Um, and on every one of those little walks yesterday, she was her little her little feet were flying at first because she wanted to go a million miles. And, and I, I sympathized with her completely. I want to take her a million miles, but there was no way. I had to super to to intervene. I had to say no, no, no. I know you want this, but this is one of those cases where I know best and. We can't do that. Uh, and even then, even with short walks, I was worried when we would get back and she would just be a blob on the floor. I would just worry, okay, was even that short walk too much? Uh, but so, so yesterday got away with me, but you should see more of me today. We're gonna finish this top shelf tomorrow. Uh, but I'm gonna wrap this up for now so this doesn't go to 40 minutes. <laughs> but I will see you soon. Thank you, book two.